Hello everyone and welcome to the Gamer Guild Podcast, your weekly show where we round up all the week's video game stories right here for you on youtube.com forward slash Gamer Guild TV and on podcast servers up in the digital clouds for your listening pleasure. We've got a great show lined up for you tonight where Mr. Chris will be joining me. How are you, Chris? Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm getting ready, waiting for the big man. It's getting close. Getting close. The big man indeed. Um, as I said, we've got a great show lined up for you tonight. I say tonight because we're recording on Friday night, quite late, 20 past 10, um, where we'll be discussing... What are we discussing? Well, leaks potentially show Insomniac is working on a Spider-Verse title. The Last of Us might be dead. Is. And E3 might be dead. <laughs> is. Is. is <laughs> confirmed. Yeah. Both confirmed. But before we get into it, uh, make sure if you haven't already, you like the video, subscribe to the channel, and ring that bell icon so you're kept in the loop of all great content here at Gamer Guild TV, such as the live stream me and Chris have literally just finished, where we mm-hmm. played some Lego Minecraft. Chris, your first impression we- to Lego Minecraft. Well, one, we didn't play Lego Minecraft. We played no, we didn't. Fortnite, <laughs> but it is highly inspired by Minecraft. And uh, yeah, we, we played it for about two hours with the wonderful community out there. Shout out to uh, Lee and Hungry Moogle who jumped in and joined us. But yeah, it's, it's Fortnite, for those who've not realised that Fortnite have just added three brand new games within their kind of ecosystem. They're not attached to Fortnite. They're not attached to Battle Royale. Uh, so we've just gone in and played uh, a bit of Lego Fortnite, which is, as Richie alluded to there, Minecraft in Lego form. Yeah go around it's a survival crafting game you build things you gather materials you survive through the night you fight wolves skeletons and stuff basically everything you do in minecraft but with a lovely cute lego skin over it in the fortnite world Uh, aside to that there's also uh, rocket racing which is made by the people who made rocket league that's now also an option there we'll probably check that out on a later stream there's also uh, a game made by harmonics who are the rock band people in the game which is called fortnite festival which is essentially rock band slash guitar hero within the game and uh, it, yeah, we've only played one of the three, all new editions, all added for free into Fortnite. And we know, and most of our viewers here on the channel are not Fortnite people. However, after two odd hours, I had a thoroughly great time with that. It was it was like Minecraft all over again. We worked as a team. Graphics look gorgeous. The the Lego skin, as I said, over everything is, is awesome. I'm, I'm a massive Lego fan. I've got plenty of platinum trophies and Lego games over the years. And this was just, yeah, fun, fun, fun world to get lost into for a few hours. Uh, Richie, what were your initial thoughts on? Pretty Lego much, Fortnite. Pretty much the same. I mean, I was also playing on PlayStation 5 Cloud Gaming, which is rare for me now, as I admit, to play on Cloud, because usually I'll actually pre-download it. Like, I, I'll leave my PlayStation in standby, and then while I'm at work, I'll just hit download. And by the time home is done, it wasn't, so I just played through the Cloud, and it was stunning. And it has a kind of zen, chill vibe that I get from a lot of... Um, survival games where you're just focused around okay we're building up our home base initially we need to collect resources a lot of punching trees a lot Mm -hmm. of punching ground of the rocks on the ground you know to get your crafting resources kill a few wolves you know the classic kind of stuff and it just has this kind of chill slowly methodical building up five okay what's our next objective our next objective is we need to go kill some crab things so we can up work a workbench and um, why do we need to upgrade our workbench so we can get a pickaxe and a better a better axe so we can get some next the next level of wood so we can build upgrade our village it's yeah, all that kind of vibe and i have a i think you're right yeah, that, that Zen nature to it is, is definitely something that appeals. And I do think, and we discussed it during the live stream, so definitely go check it out if you're interested in checking the game out. But as people who maybe don't have as much time to game, it, it does make me just feel like bad that if this was a 10-year-old version of me or a 12, 13-year-old, basically anyone who had time, I could sink like hundreds and hundreds of hours into this. Like I did for Minecraft way, way back in the day. Yeah. And just it's such a shame that's like we've played a few hours. It's like, but if I have two hours on a night do i want to go punch a tree for however long or do i want to play two hours of a story driven game that i know i'm going to get like a lot more fulfillment out of even though they're both great and different merits but yeah if you're if you're looking for something like that just zen chill gather resources craft stuff make your own little mini world within another world fortnite not minecraft lego fortnite yeah lego fortnite um, go check it out and it's free so there's no reason not to and it's on cloud performance cloud it's on amazon luna they got a, they got another i guess in a way amazon luna just got three new games Technically didn't, but they also kind of did because I mean they'll be the promoting all, it like they have. Yeah, the <laughs> modes in Fortnite, but they're basically standalone titles. Oh, and I yeah. thought it was actually quite smart of them to actually put them as modes in Fortnite because Fortnite's got a huge audience, and there's a lot of people who play Fortnite are probably just not 
don't care what other games are coming out at all, even mm-hmm. if it is a Lego Fortnite game. But by because they've dropped it in Fortnite as a mode, they're going to jump in because they're going to see it and going to try it out. Absolutely. And we found as well your cosmetic skins carry across. So I bought a Stormtrooper outfit from, I think, when it launched on maybe Switch or Luna, possibly. I think it might be the Luna stream. And it transferred across, and it turned into a cute little Lego Stormtrooper guy instead. And we were playing on our stream. We had Boba Fett in there. We had Darth Maul. So evidently, our friend group all invested in the Star Wars packs when they came out a few a while back. Not me. But it's great that they translated over to Lego. Now, you were just playing as basic bitch. Yeah, Lego I've never spent a penny in Fortnite. It'll get you one day, Richie. I it'll, don't it'll think it'll it give will. You, there'll be one mode 10, 15 years from now where they'll be like, this is Richie's, I, Richie's game. Baldur's think... Gate, Fortnite. <laughs> I think the time it had its chance to get me when it first came out on the Switch and I tried it and I just don't like the building mechan- mechanics in the ba- in the Battle Royale. I think it overcomplicates the game. I don't enjoy uh, it. It's too see, much of a learning is... curve and I just can't be bothered. So. But is this not where they might get you on the... Cra- like if we play the crafting game it, another time, another time... It it's might a get different you else. style of crafting completely though. No, but the skins are more about the cosmetics. Like, you might spend money on the no. skins at some point. No, don't do that. They'll drop a Final Fantasy skin and you'll be like, oh, I, I, I literally don't do that. £1.99. I don't even someone, like... Someone will drop you a super chat just I don't, to get you to buy I'm it. I'm the guy who pre-orders a game, gets a pre-order DLC bonus in, like, an RPG and just doesn't use it because it's, oh. I feel like it's quite cheating. I like to use the play as intended. And the second well, playthrough... Speak- because I've got the onion sword from on Final Fantasy 16 because it was a DLC I have no bonus. Idea what that is. Yeah, it was a DLC bonus. I don't know how I've got it because I didn't buy it on release, sword. but I have it. But I just refuse to use it. Wow. Well, speaking of yeah. cosmetic skins, you're uh, you shirt in real life. Oh yeah. Looking pretty, pretty cosmetic skins week. in real life. This is an awesome shirt. That that's an investment you can get behind. Yeah, yeah. It um it's part what of my tradition of getting terrible, uh, either a terrible jumper or a terrible shirt for Christmas. So we have a Mandalorian Christmas shirt, and it is loud as, like, it, you, you could see me from a different country if I was outside. <laughs> it's it's, like it's, it's like pretty that. distinctive. So ironically enough, we all bought Star Wars cosmetics in-game, and you bought one in real life. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but see, when, the, when Fortnite inevitably dies, still got the shirt. I feel like Fortnite might outlast your shirt, especially if it's made with that cheap material that most sh- holiday shirts are. Realistically, I'm wearing it this year. It's going to hang up in the wardrobe, and I'm going to see it next year and go buy a different one anyway. Probably. With a tenner. But, I don't uh, care. Uh, it's not. That's yeah. a good buy for £10. Uh, we'll yeah. probably be wearing our festive attire next week, actually, for the, the Christmas episode. Yeah, I've got a jo- we, we I've are got that close. We are that close. Yeah. The first Christmas episode of the Gamer Guild podcast. Indeed. Chris, you've been playing Return to Moria. I have, yeah. Speaking of survival crafting games, I'm in this this amazing space, games between games, where there's so much, so many options. And I know last week's episode, I was saying I'm kind of torn every which way. And we are this week. I've got, I played, I did an hour of Return to Moria, it's up on the channel. Played a little bit more since. Um, again, crafting survival. It's great. It's exact. It's basically take the description I just gave for Lego Fortnite, <laughs> apply it to Lord of the Rings, and you've got the same game. You drop into a mine, you craft for resources, you build a fire, you build a base, you upgrade your weapons, you go out and explore more. You kill wolves, you kill rats, goblins, and basically explore the depths of Moria and try and reclaim the home for the dwarves in the, in the fourth age after the events of the Lord of the Rings. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I could go and repeat, talk about it more, but it's it's almost the same as Lego Fortnite, ironically. Yeah. Well, uh, although no Star Wars skins, it was all Lord of the Rings skins. Yeah. So it's Again, the aesthetic. Even for Lego Fortnite, when we were talking about during the stream, it doesn't reinvent the wheel at all for any survival game. If you play any survival yeah. game, you'll recognise what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But it's still good. I, it, I don't think it needs to. It's just putting the fort. It's got putting a bit of a Fortnite charm to it and a little bit of Lego charm to it. But yeah, was it? Return to Moria, same. Which one would you prefer, actually? If you had to go play more now, <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot that's a, for that. That's a really tough question, just because they are, in essence, the same game. Um, I don't know, because I played the Lord of the Rings one on my own. I didn't have that uh, that team that we had in the Lego one. Yeah. And I think having a team in a survival crafting game is infinitely more fun, because you're gathering multiple resources, you're able to challenge bigger bigger enemies quicker and um i think the pace just differs a little bit and the communication as well like if you and me played return of mori together we'd be having loads of banter back and forth about lord of the the rings we'd be saying it we'd be saying that over and over again we'd be just chatting about how good the movies are were and everything like that so it's a different vibe so i'd say at this moment in time if i had to pick one i'd probably say lego fortnite because i have also got 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, everybody has it, right? Um, but again, two great games. Don't overlook them. The first looks up on the channel. Uh, and in terms of like just live streams, we should also point out, hopefully we're going to get to Skull and Bones. I touched on it a little bit in last week's podcast, but yeah, we're allowed to show an hour of footage from the beta of Skull and Bones because we are um, Ubisoft certified content creators. We're part of the partner program. Yeah. So they've given us an early access beta code for that. So hopefully we'll get some footage up on the channel as well. Um, go check that out if it's live now maybe when the show goes live the beta ends this weekend so if we had time to get it in we got it in if not but shout out to ubisoft for supplying us with a code shout out to return of moria guys for supplying us with a code and shout out to epic for giving us a free i guess everyone a free pass for fortnite <laughs> yeah thank you so very much free gaming out there cheers guys anything else you've been playing that you didn't get for free um i got the platinum in alan wake too did it um the the fitch the did the patch on the monday as i suspected so i finished the story got when and got the the platinum trophy popped in that one downloaded the rag uh, god of war valhalla dlc the roguelike one got that installed ready to check out i think i'm probably going to get the final fantasy 16 dlc as well and i've held off on buying cyberpunk ultimate edition because i don't need this many games to spin yeah. <laughs> at once so and i'm, I'm pick, picking my battles that's my thing with cyberpunk I've, I've said it before like i do want to buy it but i don't need to but i don't need to buy it because i've already played through the game i can mm-hmm. wait until it comes down in price or i have a barren spell and game and go now's the time for cyberpunk mm-hmm. i mean it's and rare know, but I'm... it does happen and I'm looking at my dashboard as well, and I've also got Horizon Burning Shores, which I bought back in March and haven't played yet. <laughs> it's still sat there. And I've still got The Witcher on my dashboard as well, where I think I started playing that when the new TV series maybe started. Yeah. But then now I'm like, is that, am I too far gone for The Witcher? Do I just wait for The Witcher 4 now? I need to decide, actually. Going problems. back to Final Fantasy, I need to decide whether I want to buy the DLC. Because I could play it quite organically, where you'd have to go back and play it. It, it's there, yeah. It's sat waiting for you. Um, um, I, I will say as a side note to this, uh, PlayStation Stars, which we give a lot of shit for on the shows over, oh God, over the years. Oh, forget that it exists. Right, so did I, but it popped up on something I can't remember. I think when I looked on the app for my Alan Wake trophies, it was like a little glistening away at the top of the app, and I thought, oh, why is it, why is it showing as a different colour? And I'm now level two on PlayStation Stars, so I actually levelled up. To level two, don't know what I did. Oh, actually, actually, I do know. I bought Alan Wake digitally because it's not got a physical yeah. release. So I got level two, which gave me more points. And actually, I had enough points to go in and purchase five pounds worth of store credit. Oh. So the Final Fantasy DLC will not cost me seven ninety nine. It will cost me significantly less thanks to PlayStation Stars. So I, I'm going to PlayStation I'm, I'm Stars. I'm look now because I've got um, eighteen hundred points. You should be able to buy five pounds worth of PlayStation store credit. I can because that's twelve hundred and fifty redeemed. There you, go. there you go, there you go, folks. So if you're watching along to this show this week, maybe worthwhile checking out your PlayStation Stars account and see if there's a free five pound credit sat waiting for you. There, there we go. go. Done. Done. That was easy. The value of PlayStation Stars, boys and girls. Enjoy. Indeed, yeah, so I, I've been, I had you just been on with Final Fantasy um, 16, and I think I'm getting towards the end. Um, I've, I'm trying to try get let you know where I am in the story without spoilers for other people. So, okay. um, what part of the map are you on to? How many? Um, how much of your skill tree have you got left to go? I'm trying. I'm trying to think of how. I'm trying to do a count of how many icons I've unlocked. Because I've just finished. I've just unlocked another one last night. Um, okay. So tell me, tell me what it is, and I'll know. Bahamut. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's a good part of the game. That one. That was a good part of the game. That was a good part of the game. Yeah. There's one or two more twists still. Not yeah. far off. That would shock me. But yeah, that is a good fight. Though. But so, how far off do you think I am from the DLC? I don't know where the DLC sits. In it. I think it's just before the final fight, isn't it? Um, maybe. I don't know. I'd, I'd probably say you've still got another 10 hours of story yeah. before you're starting your mop-up. Good yeah. crack. But I, I have been doing all the side quests every time they've come available, so I've went through yes, this kind yeah, of cycle. Sto- story, return to base, do the talk, talk around in base. Then you get the patch of side quests, go out and do them, do the hunts and stuff. 
Yeah, the only I, thing that'll keep you ticking over is at the end there is a bit of a grind to get all of your skill tree finished because there is a trophy for that. Yeah, and that it is a literal grind. You have to just go out and fight these things until you get enough points. Isn't or XP? There's some things I haven't figured out what they are yet. These like I keep coming across these kind of broken like sculptures in the wilderness, and they put a marker down, and there's nothing I can do with them. They are little arena fights, I think. If memory serves me right. All right. That unlock after a certain stage of the story when you come across one. I've come across a handful of them, and no, you have no to go unlocks. back. You have to backtrack, and they unlock into actual. Oh, some point. Did the, something in the story triggers them being more interactive. Right, because I've nothing in the game so far as I've mentioned the existence apart from I've encountered yeah. them and the map, uh, yeah. map icons turned I th- up. I thought the same thing. Yeah, I think at some point it triggers and unlocks them. But Chris, that's enough of that. We need to get into the news. So, would you like to introduce us to? The The Graciously Gathered Gamer Guild Gazette, a.k.a. The News. The News. And as always, the news is brought to you by our Guild Heroes, which you can join for as little as 99p over on the YouTube channel at Gamer Guild TV, where you get early access to certain shows, such as the Gamer Guild podcast, and, well, you can actually get episode 3.5 of my Ocarina of Time live stream. Among, there's a few other bits and pieces up there. Well, yes, yeah. and we we should say as well if, if if people are interested in it, we might look at doing the recordings of the podcast live. So there won't be any cadence to how much to be scheduled because we do them yeah, whenever we're it, all we're all free. It's a moving target. That's why we've always kind of never really wanted to commit to that. But yeah, yeah, we couldn't do like every Sunday at twelve like some other people used to do on the, in the stadium world because we were just that busy with family and work and other things and hangovers. But in terms of it, I think, yeah, if we'll try and give members something maybe in the new year, yeah. is if we're recording live, we'll just put up for members and maybe you can catch it on the, on yeah. the flip side and, and get in I the chat. It's an idea we're toying with, but we're not going to, even if we go ahead with it, we're not going to be fully committed, committing to do oh, it every like week. All the time. Yeah, yeah, it's if it makes sense for us at the time, then we'll do it. <laughs> Indeed. Chris, first news story Insomniac are potentially developing a Spider Verse game. Ooh, what would you expect from a Spider-Verse game? So I guess wait, the context for this is um, it's something really serious. Is Insomniac have, have been um, part of a ransom a ransomware attack, where in the past week they've been uh, targeted. Apparently, stuff's been leaked from their files, um, like ridiculous stuff, like the devs' passport information and stuff, like serious stuff from HR files has been leaked um, and high profile data breaches like this we know happen from time to time but essentially without reading too much in it obviously sucks for Insomniac um, everyone out there just trying to just do their job and there's people out there who just hack people's lives essentially just to get like a scrap of Wolverine news or something like that um, but in the suggested so called leak there is a uh, little evidence that points towards a uh, rumoured Spider-Verse game I mean, or not Spider-Verse game, it's reference Spider-Verse. We've known since um, f- from June 2021 that Insomniac were hiring for multiplayer projects. So I'm mm-hmm. guessing this is com- now not officially confirmed, but I'm guessing that multiplayer project is the Spider-Verse. Yeah, yeah we figured at one point it might have been um, the Concrete Genie Studio, Pixel Opus, because they've been working on something. Like They might have been a support studio or something, for all we know, but they're closed down now. Yeah. But again, we're not able to really corroborate anything but as it stands the alleged the alleged leaks say that the title is in development is class of spider-verse which i guess opens us up to thinking that with us knowing that they're working on a multiplayer game we know sony are leading leaning in to games as a service multiplayer yeah. how would we make a spider-man game and turn it into a multiplayer game we've yeah. got new york we've I got mean, that world i've usually been critical of like Sony pushing so hard towards games as a service because I think they're very hard mm-hmm. to do, and I think sometimes you're squandering your talent that are making amazing first part like single player games. Mm-hmm. In a case of trying to get cheap, what is not cheap necessary, but to make a lot of money in the multiplayer space, I'm going to give in something like a complete massive pass here because we know Wolverine's coming and we've just had Spider Man Two, so it seems like mm-hmm. they're due almost like we're going to do the multiplayer game. But it's not going to impact our first party off our single player yeah, offerings. They're they're big enough, and we know yeah. they've had that turnaround as well because they had Ratchet and Clank, and then Miles Morales was remember a launch PS5 game. So in in yeah. the, in the three years PlayStation 5's existed, they've had three titles out now. Yeah, so I think the they get a pass because they're producing a reasonable quantity of games that are reason uh, okay, kids. Every, every couple of years, you get it. Mm-hmm. Maybe every what three Absolutely. three years, 
Probably three, roughly. three years, three games. Yeah. Right? Oh well. Yeah. Is, is, is their cadence so that they're the way. I mean, we're about to talk about Naughty Dog later in the news. I'm expecting and a gap for Wolverine. I'm expecting a gap for Wolverine, though. Yeah. 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 So, but like you said, the, yeah. the size of the studio. What What do we expect to see? Like in in my mind, in terms of Spider Verse, knowing the movies, how I know the movies, we know Miles and the suits from the movies have appeared in the game. We know uh, from the original Spider-Man game that they can even drop the frame rate of the game to make it feel more like Spider-Verse. You can change the ca- to, to cartoon art style. So you think they'll go off, like literally model it off the movies? I think so. I'm, see, I was thinking this would be a completely separate thing. What do you mean separate? Completely separate to the Spider-Verse movies, just... It's going to be a Spider Verse game, as like this is. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking yeah, yeah. it's been a persistent online thing, a multiplayer experience where I'm thinking you build your own version of Spider Man. Yeah, and yeah. I'm thing, not sorry when I'm referencing that. And everyone, all the Spider Man chucked into the same world. Yeah, when I'm talking Spider Verse, yeah. I just meant like the art style of it all. So I think yeah. like the the frame, like the special frame rate they're doing the movie in the art style animation and the suits sh- exist. I don't see. For me, I hope they don't because you can get the Spider Verse skins in the game. And I think it makes the game feel horrible to play. It's mm. a now it's a novelty, but I wouldn't want to play a game the whole, like that. It feels but then too that's choppy. The whole game because hi-fi, hi-fi. I mean, you don't have to do the frame rate thing, but the art style that oh, looks yeah, the, look, the art like, style. Hi-fi Rush did that wonderfully. I'd be this okay year. with that, but the frame rate it works so incredibly well in the movie, but in the game, frame rate does matter. It can because it feels it would feel horrible to play. Yeah, it would always have to yeah. be toggled. But to what your point's saying there about, yeah, I think the way Spider-Verse works is multidimensional. Yeah. And the way the last movie went, my word, there was hundreds of hundreds of Spider-Men running around. I could definitely see if this is multiplayer, you create your character, you create your own Spider-Man. Like, it's so easy of a suit to customise, isn't it? You've seen in Spider-Man 2 and Miles, like, there's just so many outfit combinations and colours and styles. Yeah. There's enough there for cosmetic selling packs like let's face it 99p for this color 99p for this style as much as i hate to say Shaders. that out loud but if, but if this is what the game is going to be and if, i think playstation are looking for every studio to have a games and service tile in their portfolio to generate constant income so they can spend on the single player games we saw that with naughty dog although we'll talk about that shortly but in terms of this yeah i would be more than happy with create your own spider character dump me into new york or maybe even some new maps hopefully some new maps and I just go around fighting crimes. Well, I've and heard... Maybe some sprinkling some story every now and again. But I can team up with our mates. We can go take down some thugs. Occasionally drop like a kingpin weekly mission in there. See, that'd be yeah. awesome. See, I heard on another, on another podcast someone suggests, oh, they could do it like almost like Marvel's Avengers, where you have your, everyone jumps in and you party into the main hub and then bounces into levels. Do not do that. That felt so disjointed in Marvel's Avengers, and it felt you just dropping into a map. And the maps are always bland and stuff. I won't exist... If you're going to play games as a service, multiplayer experience like that, I won't exist in the world a bit more. You could have, like, maybe, like, Ratchet and Stank Trial rift portals and stuff that kind of get you in to, like, instance areas and dungeons. But mm-hmm. when I pop out, I want to pop back out in New York and have a bit more free, free reign to explore. I'm thinking more like World of Warcraft. Maybe not on the full grand scale. No. But... In that kind of thing where you go, right, yeah, most of the world is kind of open and you can go into instant dungeons and stuff. So mm-hmm. it is like more of an MMO, so you have loads of people running around. Yeah, there's so many different ways you could take it, really, isn't there? But yeah. I think I think Spider-Man, by nature of the different suits, does lend itself quite well to multiplayer. You're not like you're not trying to create several different characters or generic ass people because everyone's in a suit, so you don't really know who they are. Yeah. Like that's the reality when everyone kicked off about Peter Parker's face being changed in the Insomniac Spider Man One and Two. Different universe. Because it, I mean, at the end of the day, he wears his mask for ninety nine point nine percent of the game. So d- does it really ma- impact you that much by one or two cutscenes? Um, so I think it lends itself really, really well. They've got the array of. Um, abilities now across all three games like it varies so much between Miles and Peter across these three last games that I think there's enough in there to, to make into a multiplayer suite of, of art, like weapons yeah. and as you mentioned there you alluded to a little bit the ratchet and clank jumping through the rifts and the poles we saw a little bit of it in Spider-Man 2 that could be a really cool way of tying it into the Spider-Verse of just yeah. like yeah you zip through a portal and you're in a different map area or a hub area it, it's an instance area between. so now it's just mm. your party in this map as you go through whatever the equivalent of a dungeon is or what 
mm-hmm. that kind of thing. And then when you come out, you're back in the main world with everyone else. Mm-hmm. Not maybe not everyone playing in, in the game because like if I I almost like New York as it is as we know it from Spider Man the current Spider Man games to be this is going to be our central hub rather than yeah. Avengers where it's just this little this little base which was always poorly laid out and a pain in the ass to run around yeah. and you just kind of going oh go score let's go score the map drop in I, I just yeah. found that all very bland and you so want to explore. The- well, that's it. Thinking of the world, like New York has been done three times over now, but we saw with elements of Spider-Man Two that they could take the framework of New York. You could do a complete alternative do... New York to what you've played in the main series games. Yeah, you could. You could put it in what is it? Spider-Man twenty ninety nine. Is yeah. that the the, fu- the future Spider-Man? You could change that. You could go back to old timey wimey stuff. You could go um, full hardcore into multiverse and time travel stuff. Where well, maybe it's Spider-Man twenty ninety nine. That that's your main world, but mm-hmm. then you're going back in time to resolve things. As I don't know, some villain has got into yeah. the Spider Verse and is messing with things, and that's a kind of narrative, like through line. So you have to keep going back in time to kind of fix the events. Actually, yeah, there was a World of Warcraft dungeon that did that kind of same thing, where yeah. it went back to some of the events from Warcraft Three, and your party mm-hmm. would have to go and kind of stop the interference with the events as they played out. Well, that would be cool, wouldn't it? If yeah. You, the, the game is set in 2099, but you keep traveling through time through these portals and rifts to do different missions. But then at some point in like a year's time, they could be like, oh, this, this, this season pass takes place in the timeline of Miles Morales. And all of a sudden you're back and there's a cutscene with Miles and it's like, oh, you're a different Spider-Man. Yeah, I'm from the, the multiplayer game doing a chapter in the single player story retconning something that happened in the Miles game from 3 years ago that would be a very meta never been ha- never been yeah. done before in video games like you could drop in as a multiplayer version of your Spider-Man character halfway through the campaign of Miles Morales from 2019 and see Miles doing something in a mission that you played back in the day in the, on the PlayStation 5 story and you do a side mission You're to keep preventing, one of the other villains out of the way of getting in the way of Miles doing yeah. his thing. You're preventing that would be cool. some iteration of, let's say, like mm-hmm. Green Goblin interfering with Miles doing that mission. Yeah, you're because like he needs, often yeah. like we can't get seen. We've got to take him down. Got to take yeah. these these guys who went back downtown stealthily while you like Miles was swinging around. Yeah, and you would get that like almost like that Back to the Future hit of like Easter egg hunting. Like you're seeing things happen. Yeah. Within a game you played several years ago, it's kind of like how I'm experienced. I've um, experienced it with Alan Wake Two. There's things that happen in Alan Wake Two that directly reference like a time loop that happened in the original game 13 years ago, and it's written into the story in such a clever way. You kind of look at it, being like almost like you are time traveling, going like, "Oh, I remember that. I saw that." It's a bit. It's a mixture of member berries and clever writing. Yeah, I'm not usually into time travel or multiverse storylines, which is why I've kind of fallen off the MCU in a big way in the last few years. But I think for games it works differently than movies because movies mm. it makes everything feel kind of detached and nothing has any consequence. I think in games because it's just an opportunity for you to go for the, the devs to kind of go make an alter many 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 spin out as many iterations of New York as they absolutely want. Really, mm. you could have one where maybe Venom wins. Yeah. And okay, now you're going back into that universe to it, deal with some deal with a thing. A thing happens, and you need to go there. Yeah, stop, stop shit from kicking. There's off. always a thing that happens. <laughs> there is, and in, in, again, video games are an interactive medium, aren't they? So yeah. exploration in alternate worlds is I, so much more enriched and deeper because you you're the guy doing it, and it's contained in that one piece of media as well. It's not split across like multiple TV shows and movies, and mm, so, yeah, the quality is all over the place. It's all self-contained, apart from like as you mentioned, like the Easter eggy stuff where you're thrown in. Oh yeah, he's a. a he, he, you jump in the drop into Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man and you're going to see him fighting Doc Ock on the train. Okay, like, so now we're getting deep into like theory territory and oh, now we're different. Yeah. Like, we've, I think we've established our own head canon. Yeah, yeah. We, this, this game takes place in 2099. You go back through rifts and explore different paths. Yeah, we went deep here. <laughs> Another season, teeing up Wolverine. You go into Wolverine's world. Yeah. Just do a little mission that teases Wolverine's introduction. That won't come out for another year or two but it's yeah. in this game. It's like a teaser. You go back. Didn't we re- hear rumours of Daredevil DLC for Spider-Man yeah. 2? Yeah. There's an in for that as well. And all of a sudden we're introducing other characters from this wider universe 
what if this what if the story like, the service title with the time travel stuff we've been talking about what if your mm-hmm. character in this um, spider-verse game accidentally introduces the thing that causes mutants to care back in the past ah, okay. which ultimately creates mutants that went there before that becomes a Wolverine game. Yeah. Look at us. Look at us. Yeah, Give us a go. job in the MCU writers' room. We'll pull something together. They need some decent writers in um, there at the moment. Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's just been ca- since it's since things. Endgame. It's been mediocre at best. Anyway, well, talk about anyway. mediocre at best, Chris. E3 is dead. It's, Actually, yeah. for real this time. Genuinely dead. Official comes from their own the horse, the horse's mouth. Yep. Um, so E323 is cancelled and reading from Eurogamer, and it's uncertain if it will ever return the same way again. But it, I don't know how it comes back. It's, how many years has it been since we've had an E3? It's hard to pinpoint it because some of them they've actually had going, and then they've had to cancel them like quite last minute. Um, the last one they were attempting was last year. They handed it over to Read Pop who do like packs, I think, and stuff, other events uh, in the States. And even they couldn't pull it off, and it got cancelled, I think, the last one. And they said, we'll be back next year, and then seemingly now they ain't coming back. So, yeah, the e- E3 is owned by the ESA. Uh, they issued a joint statement, uh, and I quote, this was a difficult decision because all the efforts we and our partners were put towards making the event happen we had to do what's right for the industry and what's right for E3. We appreciate and understand that interested companies wouldn't have had playable demos. Uh, they would have had playable demos ready and resource and challenges for getting ready for next year, uh, but we didn't want to commit to it. We're sorry we can't put on a showcase that you deserve and that you've come to expect from Read Pop. That's from the event service. But yeah, it's um, again been a long time coming, but yeah, when you any talk, surprise? No, when you hear people who've been in the industry for a long time and actually in the industry in a proper way, unlike we are. Mm-hmm. They've always talked about how E3 has been, for, since since they opened the gates to general consumers, what E3 was originally is kind of di- already died and it just slowly lost what made it special. Mm. And I think as well, it was inevitable. I think it was inevitable. Once Nintendo figured out the Nintendo Direct for- format for providing video game news to people, in a way, in that con- kind of controlled way, and then started just push that into the E3 stage. I think that was probably the beginning and the end at that point, because the pandemic, I think, very much es- like accelerated the whole thing, because then everyone so, went, we're going to do the Nintendo thing, and it worked, yeah. and now what's the point of E3? Yeah, and Sony pulled out as well. Yeah. Um, said, we won't be back, we won't be coming back this year. Uh, that was 2018. Like in, yeah, ages ago. And then, yeah, I think the pandemic just kind of compounded... Like financial wars, like they wouldn't have had any income for what two years on the bounce. And apparently, the booths and stuff are so expensive. So you're spending a floor lot space, of yeah. you're spending a lot of money on floor space, or you could spend yeah. that money on making games. Yeah, and Did you Capcom still have like to four. do a press conference. So you can, and if you do your own press conference, you can then yeah. decide when you want it. You can optimize yeah. when it goes out, so you're not compete. You're you're not competing head to head with every other game in the industry. And it's all about it's again. It's been on a slow decline just by nature. But like E three began back in the day when, like in the nineties, when physical media was a thing. Like people had to go to these expos to showcase their products for for um, retailers to make purchase orders on how much stock they wanted to take of said product. So it was there as like an internal it, industry thing. It's and it there. Kind of grew and grew with journalists getting more involved. And that's when kind of the, the wide like, world of gaming. It's to help with bigger. publishing. So you go. You, I've got. A, I'm a small dev. dev. I've got. A game i'm looking for a publisher mm-hmm. to get the game off the ground or we're looking for get some press so when the press are walking the floor you get the hands on the demo and then because all the industry is in one place you have all the behind the scenes meetings and stuff that will ha- happen but it's a small industry to be honest like it's quite insular so everyone knows everyone anyway yeah. so a lot of these meetings just happen online nowadays you've seen this from the game awards didn't you like yeah. people know people but it's um it's a sad thing, but it, I think it has been coming when after the COVID lockdown and stuff, and all the, and everyone pivoting towards like digital. Most of the people who would have been there, even third party companies like EA or Ubisoft and stuff, they don't need them because instead of having like a segment of a two week news cycle, you can pick a random ass day in the middle of nowhere and just have the whole news cycle for the day, the week, the month, depending on how quiet the rest of the industry is being, you can just take that flag and run with it for as long as you want without the need of paying someone, 
being present and then hoping your story gets picked up by journalists who are there to cover everything because they get run off their feet and exhausted as well. And it's just it's a lot of like things that have just compounded to it. Whereas realistically, they've not helped themselves. I think they they struggle to reformat. Um, they they could have done a pivot to digital before anybody else. Jeff and Keighley jumped in too, and, and he fast. jumped in, made Summer Game Fest, and now arguably that's like in one fell swoop knocked E3 out and was like, yeah, we're the digital event for every summer. And he just, again, Jeff does a very good job at like only loosely connecting to things. Like he doesn't do the Ubisoft stuff. He, he just tweets out that the Ubisoft stuff is taking place three days before his event, which yeah. therefore encompasses Summer Games Fest because he says so. <laughs> like it's so, it's such a clever way of marketing it. And that's the thing. I think a big thing when you, if you're trying to publish a game, especially if you're not the, like if you're the blockbuster title, that's gonna, it's, you're always going to cut through the, the mix regardless what happens. Like God of War absolutely just blew everyone away when that was dropped. As just as an example, but if you're like the next tier down of games, and you've got like maybe five or six God of War esque style standard games at that showcase, mm -hmm. and you're that in that row below that next like within that next ten, you can easily be forgotten about. Like I'm thinking, it's like something like Avowed. Like I always mm -hmm. forget what that game is and when it's coming, and so it just doesn't seem to have the same level of resonance that like Spider Man Two or Last of Us. Or God of War stuff like that is typically had with me, and they're easy games to forget when there's so many games coming out. But yeah. if you're not on E3 and you're a part of like here's ten games, it's easy to remember that game. Yeah, and they're not it's not these games. I'm not saying are bad games in any stretch of the imagination. Like it just makes you, you have more opportunity to have that like shine shined on you. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully with E3 being gone we'll see more of a rise and focus on things like indie titles or double a where because they're able to put their own showcases out or their own trailers out at set times you're not really beholden to anything but i know there's been a couple of different companies doing indie showcases across the years but as the bigger ones yeah kind of take their own platform and just make their own stuff maybe indies will have like a bit of a boon off the back of this but only time will tell. Well, do you think E3 will be repackaged into anything? Like, is it truly gone, or do we think Jeff Keighley steps in and takes the trademark and changes I don't know. Summer Game See, Fest into like a hybrid of them all? Like, does the brand carry any weight anymore, or is it just totally like everything about it's dead and defunct, and E3 doesn't actually mean anything? I think it is actually just done. Uh, I think they're like. I'll give you one dollar. I think the E3 ESA. Rates. They might turn up in some of way, shape, or form because they still need to make money somehow because they're the certifying body mm -hmm. for like for games in the US. So they have to they have to have an income somehow. But I don't know. Like E3 is just they've I think they've just literally lost that battle because as for all the reasons we've outlined, Jeff Keighley doing like the collective thing has kind of stole their spotlight, and then most develop most publishers will hold their own events now because literally the events is nowadays are as detailed as getting someone on stage this is even a complicated event that we see get someone on stage who's prominent in in your publish publishing company to talk through the things as you show the trailers on a youtube video mm. it's not a full-on stage production uh, it can be but it doesn't have to be so yeah, yeah. it's crazy thing like back in the day really when like all the stuff that we've had like i remember like li like years ago like knowing that that period in the summer where we got everything in one go, we were going to get Nintendo news, we were going to get PlayStation, we were going to get Xbox news, and to that point where we had them all on stage, didn't we? At one point, all like the leaders of all three brands, and it's just like, wow. Yeah. Was that Game like, Awards? The, the, so? It might have been. I'm just might be blurring yeah. the lines between them again. Damn it, Jeff Keighley. But just yeah, just over the years, like we've got such big announcements that come out of it, and it's a shame that they maybe don't all get together in person because there is something special about a stage show as opposed to just a digital presentation with an artificial voice over the top of a gun. This yeah. month on PlayStation, we've got this. It's like, but we we, we there's, there's a about human element. Game Awards, we how many unnecessary adverts and stuff are in in there and stuff? Just they've got to fund it somehow. If you're going to yeah. do the big full on showcase thing. Like two, three hour showcase. And A3 was not even that, it's a week. Um, mm. it, that's got, it takes a lot of money to run. It it's does. a lot of staff, a lot of logistics. And yeah, it's, and unfortunately, I think it's unfortunate more for fans rather than journalists because I would have loved to go to A3 and say it would be amazing. Yeah, 
same. I'd but, still like to get a Gamescom. Like Gamescom could step in and do something. They do so well in Europe. Yeah. But. And there's, there's other conventions and stuff as well that might take that kind of... We're going to do... A, it's going to be a fan-focused event. We're going to invite developers to mm. showcase stuff. I doubt you'll get big new stuff at that sort of thing, but you might get first hands-on with, like, I don't know, in the run-up to Wolverine. You might get your first hands-on at a Gamescom or something like that. Potentially, yeah. but for now, RIP E3. And also, RIP The Last of Us. So oh, we have different yeah. thoughts on this one, actually. You Give us the update. So, The Last of Us Online, as we've so often been referring to as Last of Us Factions, has officially been cancelled. Your thoughts, Chris, because I'm very... Eh. So I'm not, I'm more than that update. bothered. We had a blog post go live from Naughty Dog this past Thursday, <clears throat> December the 14th. An update on The Last of Us Online. We realise many of you have been anticipating news around the project that we've been calling The Last of Us Online. There's no easy way to say this. We've made the incredibly difficult decision to stop development on that game. We know this news will be tough for many, especially our dedicated The Last of Us Factions community who've been following our multiplayer ambitions ardently. We're equally crushed as a studio. We're looking forward to putting uh, putting it in, in your hands. We wanted to share with you some background on how we came to this decision. The multiplayer team has been in pre-production with this game since we were working on The Last of Us Part 2. That came out in 2020, just as a size note. So that's three, nearly four years ago. Crafting an experience we felt was unique and had tremendous potential. As the multiplayer team iterated on the concept for The Last of Us Online during this time, their vision crystallized, the gameplay got more refined and satisfying, and we were enthusiastic about the direction in which we were headed. In ramping up to full production, the scope of our ambition became clear. To release and support The Last of Us Online, we'd have had to put all of our studio resources behind this post-launch, content for years to come severely impacting development on future single player games so we had two paths in front of us become a solely live service game studio or continue to focus on single player narrative games that have defined naughty dogs heritage we are immensely proud of everyone at the studio that touched the project the learnings and investment in technology from this game will carry into how we develop our projects going forward and will be invaluable in the direction we are heading as a studio we have more than one ambitious brand new single player game that we're working on at naughty dog and we cannot wait to share more about you when time is ready until then we're incredibly thank you to our, uh, thankful to our community for your support throughout the years so yeah, yeah. It's it's done. So after three, four years and teasers at the Game Awards and concept art being dropped in the summer and The Last of Us Factions it, seemingly not coming to part two when it launched because it got spun off into its own thing. It seems like it's grow, grow up and scale and scope and scale and eventually is like it's got the point where it would basically consume the studio. Yeah. So I think they made the right decision based on that. I'm and split both ways because I'm I'm a massive, massive fan of factions. Last of Us Factions is some of the best multiplayer I've played in, in, in forever. But is it better it than Naughty Dog single player offerings? No. No, it's and not. And they're saying to do it would be at the spe- expense of not doing the single player offerings. Exactly. So he's my the well, not my theory, my point is if as they describe in their thing, it's uh grew in scope concept, it was unique and had had tremendous potential. It was uh, the gameplay became refined. The vision was crystallized and satisfying, and we were enthusiastic about the direction. So you know what you do, Sony? You outsource it to one of the other studios that you own. Yeah, that's what I would say. You don't just sack it off and scrap three years worth of development on what they're describing as. Again, at your base, factions was fantastic. You could have just given me another factions with modern day graphics. You that, run up I would have lapped that up. You run up another not a second Naughty Dog studio. So it's still in, in the house under Naughty Dog, so it's still controlling the IP. But you have a, a multi you just scale up the multiplayer team. I, I've got a fi- I don't know what the first one that came to mind as you were reading that was. I feel like they've had to fight Sony to let them make this decision. Hmm. It feels well, we like that's a decision from... that they've wanted because it's been quiet for a while. It well, feels like they've probably made the their leaks. decision internally a while ago, and they've been having to get Sony to go give them the yes to stop working on the thing. I think we're seeing a pivot away from games as a service. I think with Jim Ryan about to leave at the turn of the year, yeah. and he seemingly has been the one pushing for live service and games the fact with that new leadership under- coming in. 
and there's been a little heavy a criticism since they announced that new direction. Mm-hmm. It's like, and this is not why you lo- we love you, Sony. <laughs> like, yeah. And then with nothing seemingly materialising, and we know Bungie has struggled with debt. Like, they bought Bungie for to, to own a solid lives as a service, and they seemingly are struggling. And they remember reportedly they were the ones who came in and looked at this game and said, mm, it doesn't have legs, doesn't have longevity, it's not going to make you money long term. So they sacked it off. But then this goes back to, why must a multiplayer game last forever? Like, just put it out with your old school matchmaking and have... capture the flag style things, like yeah. the original factions, and let it have a server for well, a few years and then wind it down if you, no one's playing. You it. get a lot of similar stuff in TV shows. Like, the first, how many TV shows where the her season is amazing and then it goes to crap after that? Because yeah. it's just like, the, who, when they came up, they're passionate about this project. They developed probably over many years, developed the story, pitched it, got cancelled, pitched it, got cancelled, reworked it, and finally hit the gold dust, got it greenlit, did as well, and the studio goes, you have to do a season two, now you have six months to work on this. Mm-hmm. Like, why can't you just go, right, we've got, we've got an idea for a multiplayer game, it's going to last for three years. This is our roadmap. Year one, year two, year three. Our plans maybe uh, three to five years, and after that, we're calling it, and we're moving on. Yeah. And it's, it's an. I think it stings more because of one the, the time that's been spent. Yeah. Like we'll never see this seemingly. Two, they've got they're going to have had two remasters out in this time, so they've gone back and just remade the same stuff. So there's nothing new came out of them. We've not had another Uncharted game. The, we're getting the roguelike survival mode, which I'm guessing is what's left of Faction slash Online. Like they had something that was maybe that fun might and be enjoyable and ran one of them thing, all in the bin. That might be one of them things that didn't necessarily need the online component. They can just jettison yeah. that and get it in. And Pivot. Just go, yeah. What can we sack? Yeah. What can we salvage? But it's just. I think it's more. It's that disappointment. Similar to what we talk about other stories of like games that have been in development for so long and you just don't know what's happening with them. And I think as someone who's a massive Last of Us fan. As much as I enjoy the story, it's like undoubtedly some of the best stories ever told in games. It was nice to have something that was a bit just off script. Like just jump in online, kill some dudes, scavenge some parts, craft some items, and just go have Last of Us combat fun in a world that didn't have me hitting a cutscene after 20 minutes. Yeah. Or I, I feel having like... to play to a story narrative. It was just me running around, shouting at people, killing people, being killed myself. And just getting points. And I feel that if you're going to do that, it needs to be at launch. Because with a single player title like The Last of Us, you're going to have a massive fall off in your user base after probably oh, the first six, after mm-hmm. the first few months. So you need it within no later than that's it, two months after launch, your multiplayer experience is coming out. Otherwise, your player base is gone. Yeah. And Or it has to be a standalone title, in which case it has to stand on its own legs. Which, I don't know... See, I've never played Factions, so I don't have the same thing, like, kind of connection to that game as you. Yeah. I have played The Last of Us. I love The Last of Us. I love every, I've loved every single Naughty Dog game I've played, and I want them just to purely focus on the single-player narrative stuff, because that's what I think they're the best in the world at. Yeah. So I, I'm uh, looking at, I've always looked at Factions and or Last of Us Online going, I'd rather you don't do it. Yeah, so for those who don't know about factions, how it worked is it was the same concept as like you have in the game, is you start off on like two teams, like 6v6, 5v5, I can't recall what the numbers were, and you drop in the world, you've got like basically a basic weapon, um, a basic couple of crafting pieces, you find toolboxes to get your crafting collectibles, and you scavenge around, you make molotovs, you upgrade your weapons, you find med kits, that kind of thing, and you have to capture like points, like capture the flag kind of scenario. Um, in the world but by nature of having to scavenge for your stuff kind of like PUBG how that works like you start off crap but if you if you are stealthy enough if you are uh, sneaky and you can craft and kind of measure your resources you can upgrade your armor you can upgrade your weapon so that when you do bump into somebody else in this in this open area is you've got that advantage so sitting still and camping doesn't benefit you you have to get out and explore the world so it creates this interesting dynamic where you might bump into someone but if you've both got like rubbish resources, you can't really kill each other just yet. So you've got to be aware that someone's near you, 
but you need to kind of peel it back a little bit, go yeah. find some of the bits and pieces, then go into the attack. And when you've got a team of like 5v5 all doing that same dynamic, it, in these little Last of Us, like, you know what the level design is like from Naughty Dog, it's terrific. So you've got like verticality, you've got things to hide behind, you've got the listening sense, so you can upgrade your listening ability. So some people can hide somewhere and see people coming, they can shout them out to the team and say there's two people coming around the corner. You've got some, it's just... It's hard to describe, but it's just a shame that we've had to wait, what, 10 plus years now yeah. to get another iteration of that. And I'm going to check out the the no return roguelike element. Of course I am. But it's just a shame to think so much resource is seemingly just lost yeah, it to, sounds to, to, like to nothingness. It does sound like there's a great experience in there, but I wish they were doing it like Insomniac, where, uh, where Insomniac is seemingly working on a multiplayer experience. For now. Without <laughs> it impacting their single player output where with Naughty Dog it mm. does very much feel like this has gotten in the way of the single player games we've had as you yeah. said nothing since The Last of Us Part 2 nothing on the horizon apart from remakes and remasters mm. it just makes you think like what are they doing over there at that studio like this is they were the doing best this. premium studio exactly so does that mean we'd have to wait now another three years so I'd, for the next project? I'd or? love to know whether this was a case of this is what Naughty Dog wanted to do or this is what Sony demanded Naughty mm. Dog do and they actually did come up with something good but still actually we don't want to be doing this. This is not what we as a studio want to be doing regardless of the quality of the product that we can make. Man, I know. I'm just yeah. thinking another I, element of factions is like when you do I'd the love to have the best of both game, worlds. Yeah. Like, so when you finish like a multiplayer match, if you did well in the match, it would give you resources to feed your camp of survivors. Yeah. So if I'm doing just like a random matchmaking game, like you would in Call of Duty or any multiplayer thing, and you lose, and you're like, oh, my kill death ratio is affected. In the Last of Us world, it does it. So every multiplayer game you take part in, it feeds into a three month cycle of your camp. So if you have a bad run of a few games, you lose resources for your camp and people will die. And what it did on the PS3 was really unique. It tied into your Facebook account. So when I used to log into The Last of Us Factions, Richie, I had you, I had Rob, I had other people in my camp. And if I had a bad run of games in Factions, it would go, Rob has died. <laughs> Richie is starving. So I had to go out, play more multiplayer games, to gather resources, do well, to bring food and medical supplies back to camp so you guys could survive and we could see our season. And that's like that's the extra element that they added, which made it really engaging because I was protecting you and Rob and my friends and family, all who I had connected on Facebook. So it was quite saddening at times when people would die, but it gave me that incentive to go out into the world. But looking at like the concept art we got of like there's a there's a cruise ship level, there's a, an entire city um, near I think it was on San Francisco potentially of just like I'm picturing just like the gorgeous Naughty Dog aesthetics. And just more space to roam around in with other people. It's not just me and AI enemies and dogs and stuff like that. Like again, the Last of Us Part Two is fantastic for that. But there's something that you can't get that you they get from AI, which is real people hunting you down and not following like a systematic yeah. pathway or anything. But like you said, it's it, it's best of both worlds. That, yeah, yeah. Getting get the wrong weapon out or tripping over or try to reload at the wrong time, like all those little intricate things. But Maybe we'll, it'll show up in part three or whatever it looks like. And again, whatever Naughty Dog put out was going to be fantastic. But like you said, it's just a shame of what could have been. And the fact that it got three years in before they had to make this decision, it, albeit it probably is the right decision in terms of resources. I don't want them spread, spread too thin and making the next game worse or take longer. But just when I look at the other things we talk about, like the Horizon multiplayer, sounds fantastic. The Spider-Man one we've just spent 20 minutes discussing on this week's show sounds fun and fantastic. I think that The Last of Us could have worked really, really well, and it's just a shame we'll never get to see Factions 2, from my point of view. Yeah, it's it's a shame. Um, you know what else is a shame, Chris? The day before developer, Fantastic, is shutting down all of a sudden. It's just launched the day before, immediately out of Steam Early Access, and went, bye. This is not a shame. This is no. what happens with bad management, bad development, and asset flipping from some from other places. Okay. So the days before is the name of the game as well, by the way. It just sounds yeah. like the way you read it out, it sometimes sounds like you're just talking about, oh, the day before, this it's, happened. The and developer everyone is gone. What do you mean the day before? Fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, so this game, ironically enough, looked like a Last of Us open world survival game. Yeah. 
with guns and crafting and everything I've just described, but made by a developer that has not got a great history with putting out games. Um, it's been rumoured that it's Vaporware for so long, and yeah, the game launched this week after a few delays, and people were saying the early access was a bit funny. Um, there's a lot of there's a full Reddit thread of people saying like the assets don't belong to the devs. They basically took them, flipped them and put them into the game from like the um, epic library and stuff so they don't own the stuff that's making up the game almost like it's been made an unreal engine or something but without actually yeah, getting the proper licenses yeah and um the game launched the studio announced the shutdown with immediate effect and now the game has been pulled from the steam store and stuff because of all the refunds that have been requested because the game runs like shit apparently and now yeah. it doesn't exist technically so yeah I don't know what more I mean, we want to go into. Really, this is just another blip in the games industry. They put our whole tweet like apologizing and saying like games are hard to make and we've got to pay off our the people we're in debt to. Which please don't accuse us bad, of scamming. But, yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know. I, they they frequently use unpaid volunteers to to work on the game as no, well, which is never, apparently a thing. Never, no, you don't do that. And. Uh, yeah, it just all seems to have collapsed in itself. But yeah, the trailer looked good. So they did enough to convince. But I guess that's part of the charade, isn't it? You trick people with a great cinematic trailer, convince people it looks like it's going to be a great survival game. It's supposed to be coming to PlayStation Five at some point, but yeah, yeah the days before an extraction was... sh- extraction shooter, which is a genre mm-hmm. of games that's seen. I don't know. There's a million. There's a million of extraction shooters out there, so. You've got it's one of them. I think you have to be great to stand out in that genre. I mean, Rainbow Six Siege didn't even manage it. It's uh, yeah. it's problematic, isn't it? But yeah, it's uh, overwhelmingly negative reviews on Steam. No surprise. Yeah. Oh yeah, but I, I had a quick look at that actually, and most of them are because of like Steam's refund policy screwing people over. The fact that the game's dead. I think people review bombing it so people don't fall into the trap of buying a game that's about to get pulled. Yeah, and then I mean, Gavin the issues yeah. like it's a rare set time when I actually look at review bombing and go okay, it's it's merited. Yeah, yeah. Um, early access review, product refunded. The fact that Steam is breaking their return policy for this game and giving people a no questions asked refund, regardless of the time played, really tells you the full story. <laughs> yeah, is pretty much all you need to know about this. I'm not even sure I would call this review bombing. Just it seems to be reviewing. Just, yeah, the day I got scammed, yeah. refund. Absolutely, do not even consider buying this broken game. They released the day before and closed the day after. <laughs> that's the Recommended? best. Recommended? That's the best summary. Yeah. That's the best summary review. I love it, I love it. Yeah, but... Moving on to another game that is disappearing, Chris. The original crew game has been removed by Ubisoft. Why? Why would you do that? Like it's been, it's been de- delisted and will be no longer playable from April 2024. Yeah, that makes sense. Servers, it literally Ubisoft to say due to upcoming server infrastructure and licensing constraints. That's the thing with with any games, isn't it? Yeah, we, we we've had this discussion before with uh, Gran Turismo, right? Gran Turismo six or something. Or one of the Gran Turismo's got motorsport. Gran Turismo Sport, I think, got de- said they were going to delist certain things, and we considered it maybe to the vehicle licensing, like Porsche, Ferrari, and stuff. Like you can't yeah. hold on to them forever, I guess. In, in today's world, where everything's old, digital, there's a way you can do it though. You can make an offline version. Well, yeah, that's why you buy the disc physically. Yeah, but then you still can't play because it's an online. It's requires. Oh, yeah, online. I guess that's where this is. What I mean, will. you have an online, off, fully offline version. Mm. Yeah, you're going to lose certain features, but the majority of the game will still be there. Got a bad. I guess this is where Ubisoft have the option to renew the licenses potentially. But then when they look at the slate of games, they're like, "Well, we'd rather people play the Crew Motorfest, the third yeah. entry that just came out. Oh. So we'll de- delist, eat our costs." And funnel them to if there are fans of this genre and this game, then they will. You'd like to think naturally would have probably moved on to the new one by now. Like the crew came out a good while ago, right? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to think I'd, you'd think most people have moved on, but yeah. a, again, I think there is a way you could handle this where people who've already I'd still delist it from storefronts. Mm-hmm. You're going to close down the servers, but if you just kind of patch it, so it, it run, the majority of the game runs offline. Yeah. 
Maybe yeah, obviously timed sense. events and stuff. You could still preserve probably a good seventy to eighty percent of the game, the gaming experience for people who've already paid for it. Yeah, it is just a shame that you can no longer jump into that game and explore that open world because it'll be de- oh. disconnected. So it's like that's a shame because like all that work that went into making like a lush terrain and exploration and driving around that yep. you can't just do it offline. There's another f- cool thing that Ubisoft potentially could do in the Crew Motorfest. Okay. They could just rebuild the game. Add the map. Add the like map. They did for yeah, and Fortnite. Or add the map. And if you have if you have the original crew in your Ubisoft library, there you got free DLC. Thank you for your support over the years. Otherwise, you got paid. Yeah, reading. I mean, reading through the the, the the quoted saying after almost a decade of support, we'll be decommissioning the crew one. Like how it gets called the crew one now after the fact. Uh, after over a decade of support, we understand this may be disappointing for players who are still enjoying the game, but it's due to necessary upcoming server and license constraints. Our goal remains to provide the best action driving gameplay experience for players and deliver on it. We're continuing to provide new content and support for the crew two and the recently launched crew motorfest. We thank everyone who played crew one and contributed to building the great community that lives on in the crew two and motorfest. I mean, I guess it, it just means that the crew two will probably go the same way in another five years time and yeah. then as we've theorized you with a lot of ubisoft games is we'd love them to just be like platforms so i think motorfest not being called the crew three could go a long way to being constantly supported but then at the same time we've also said you could probably merge the crew and riders republic into one game to some degree as well like the concept of you dropping with your character and you go do some BMXing, you go do some paragliding, you go do some racing in any vehicle. It kind of all ties nicely in together and it all runs in the same engine. So like consolidation of not only like studios but also licenses in, in a weird way. The crew, Republic, <laughs> Riders, Motorfest. Do yeah. do what you want with it, Ubisoft. But uh, Riders yeah. Republic, that Ubisoft need to show that game a bit more love. It just seems like they've got a great platform there that they just seemingly ignore. You never hear anything about it. It might just not be in them circles anymore. Yeah, but we, we but pay attention again, to the I Ubisoft like, stuff all the time. Yeah, but I feel like extreme sports in general has just been on a decline. Like like with racing games, like we've said how many times, it's like once you get older and you can drive for real, the, yeah. the allure of racing games, unless you're into like the sport, it's crazy. But either way. But we are certified Ubisoft all right, creators. We well, yeah. are. <laughs> Yeah. Skull and Bones should be in Riders Republic. BMX, yeah. paragliding, you can have the cross, a ship. You do the cross pollination where if you've got on both games, you get like free skins or something. Ah, oh, fuck it. Just add everything to Assassin's Creed Infinite or Infinity yeah. or whatever that is. There's your hub world in the Animus and you just go off and play Riders Republic yeah. as an assassin. <laughs> you know who is adding everything to everywhere, Chris? Microsoft. Because now you dun, can dun, get dun. Game Pass on the Meta Quest free. Mm. Yeah, Meta, Meta Quest guess. 3 is getting some big get for Meta. It is, yeah, and it's in a way it's the kind of the perfect partnership with for Xbox because, as we know, they've not been working on VR in the slightest, so it gets the foot in the door without doing really any any hardware or anything like that. You're on mute. Yeah, oh, well, I actually said probably for the best that they hadn't been working on because I've got nothing against VR. It just feels like you tip usually because the next story actually does count to my point. Usually, you're getting a worse experience than not a VR game, and you have to buy an expensive headset to play it on top of the expensive hardware you already have. Yeah, that's that's my criticism of VR. It's just it's not as good as it needs to be to compete. Yeah. Yeah. We should also say the great thing with this is it's what, it's what we theorized for years with Stadia is how does it work? How do I play games like Starfield and Hi-Fi Rush in my eyes using VR? And the answer is in the clouds, like it always has been, boys and girls, is you don't have to overheat the headset. The headset doesn't even have to be that powerful because all it needs is this screen that has a decent connectivity to the internet so that it can broadcast the game to your eyeballs. And that's what Seemingly is doing. So in a summary reading from the blog, it says, players with Xbox Game Pass Ultimate can now enjoy hundreds of games with their MetaQuest headset thanks to Xbox Cloud Gaming. Award-winning titles like Forza Motorsport, Hi-Fi Rush, and Starfield can be experienced anywhere, anytime with a MetaQuest headset. Get started by downloading the Xbox Cloud Gaming app from the MetaQuest store and launch it on your headset. And boom, it just puts it in your face, Richie. It doesn't now, overheat the device because it's just a screen. Now, the one thing we ne- I think we need to be clear on here, 
this is not necessary VR games, VR forms of these games. This is the no, fake screen. A screen. There's a fake screen hanging about in your face, which okay. Picture a 3D cinema, like you just sat immersed in it. Now, the difference is, by today's standards, the MetaQuest 3 and the PSVR 2, the the pixel density you're getting on these two screens is... If you've ever done like VR before, if you try like Google it's Cardboard really or something like that, it's so much better now. Like there's there's minimal light gets in, the the clarity, the the way they've got that 3D balance, which tricks your eyes into thinking you're in a 3D space. So much better. VRs came on so much more, and that's why unfortunately it still is mega expensive. Remember, Apple are putting out a Apple VR, which is which costs three and a half grand yeah. next year. Three and a half grand, Richie, for a piece of tech. That's insane. Yeah. But it's rumored to be phenomenal. No, nope. so. This partnership, actually, I think could go the other way as well. You could then eventually get your MetaQuest. Is MetaQuest, is the MetaQuest um, standalone? Or is yeah. it a PC? Yeah, yeah. so standalone. All in one unit. Yeah, so you might be able to get cross-pollination deals and stuff going on between Microsoft and Meta to get it out there. And you could even start seeing some VR versions of some games, com- comic proper VR versions, because I think something like Starfield could do mm-hmm. VR. Skyrim is already in VR, isn't it? There, there is a VR. Alter. Obviously, no Resident Evil works as well. But this is the thing where it's a, so it's you a could start getting it. some of them. So rather than just the screen in it, you could get a mm-hmm. VR version of this game, which is just native, a native VR yeah. version. Because to be honest, the screen in front of you and the headset, I don't. I think it's you sat there on your couch wearing an uncomfortable headset. Yeah, I think there's more downsides than positives unless you've got a terrible telly. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting one. It's all if you want that full immersion. But I, it's an, I guess so. Yeah, it's still a nice, it's still a nice addition. So if you have a MetaQuest, and you, I don't know, you live in a busy household, you don't always have access to TV. You can just literally put your MetaQuest Quest headset on in the loo. There you go. You can get your full gaming experience wherever you are because you don't need to take the headset off. Absolutely, I you can walk from the couch to the loo. When you want to go to bed, you go to bed. Just keep the headset on. Live your life in yeah. VR, but uh, Sell I think you're right. it, it's a clever partnership. I think that benefits both parties involved really, really yeah. well. It gives MetaQuest a boost upon game titles, and oh, it gives a Xbox huge a foot, boost. Uh, I mean, huge, huge boost. Um, and then it gives Xbox, yeah, foot in the door with VR without having to really overcommit to the to the R and D. Yeah, you can. But you now have, Xbox have effectively now have a platform to experiment with VR type VR games. Mm-hmm. And if you don't want Game Pass. Then apparently Quest is also getting some terrific VR titles. Indeed, such as the IGN rated ten out of ten Asgard's Wrath Two. Yeah, which is a pack-in title for the Meta Quest Three, by the way. So if you buy yeah. it, you will get this game. And this goes to show, Richie, why back to last week, this has been the best year for video games. Yeah, proven, proven by the fact Asgard's Wrath. Is a ten out of ten VR game. Only in twenty twenty three will you get a VR game that drops that is a ten out of ten. That is such a rare commodity to get. Now, wow. Do we know if IGN are rating this just as a VR game or just as a game? Full stop. Because I think it's it should be rated parcel, purely right? as a game. The VR I mean, in this should be an addition. It shouldn't be. You shouldn't be stacking this up with just against other VR games in terms of perceived quality. No, I think they just review it as a like. Perfect. I don't think That's you what give you want. An extra caveat, because yeah. like if you look at other games, they yeah. give a lot of plenty of VR game shit scores. Um, yeah. But yeah, just te- I mean, I've seen it promoted but, lots recently, and I've never really it, like thought too much about it. I but think then, we've both seen it. We've both seen it recently. We thought it looked good, but the, with it being a VR game, we largely dismissed it. But yeah. like, it clearly deserves its attention. Like, and I don't have a meta quest. Yeah. But to read from the IGN, which gave a ten out of ten. This is, I think, that maybe the fourth ten out of ten they've gave this year. That's it. Um, which calls, which categorizes it as a masterpiece. Again, it's just one person's impression. But reading from the verdict, Asgard's Wrath is the full-fledged VR open-world RPG I've always wanted to play. And for that matter, it's one of the best RPGs in any perspective I've played in years. With four unique characters and stories, fantastic and satisfying combat, intricate and rewarding RPG systems, a great story, and an entire roguelike dungeon crawling mode thrown in just to show off, this masterpiece completely nails almost everything it 
Quake tries, much of which has never been pulled off in VR. The MetaQuest 3's killer app has arrived, and even after more than 90 hours throwing squids at glorious shredded lizards and whipping across gaps, I'm still eager to jump back in. What a review for a VR game. I mean, yeah, I think this game generally looks looks amazing. It's doing the thing that VR should do, and it's producing a high-quality game that can only be done in VR. It's not like, oh, we're tagging the VR mode on, or it's just a slight change of perspective. It just, the way you interact with this game feels like you couldn't just, you couldn't really do it with a controller. Mm. And that's what you want. And that's that's the advantage of VR, is always going to be the higher level of immersion, which you won't get sitting in front of a TV with a controller. Yeah, it makes it a true role playing game. It does. Because you are fully in, but yeah, looking at MetaQuest, um, sorry, not MetaQuest, Metacritic reviews, sitting at 94. Um, Game Rant give it a nine out of ten as well. So I'm sure there'll be a few more that are probably going to come. And Xbox Era give it a nine out of ten. God is a geek give it a nine out of ten. Game Rant give it a nine out of ten. That's yeah. high praise. But yeah, what what do you have for video? I get, I'll probably never get around to playing this unless it I somehow get a, a MetaQuest three. Yeah. But you know what? That's high praise. So. Asgard's yeah. Ralph's MetaQuest 3 and Xbox Cloud Gaming on it included. It's it's a good end of the year for MetaQuest. Indeed. And it's rare for me to praise Meta in any way, shape, or form. Um, last few stories. We actually were thinking about doing our PlayStation Xbox wrap-ups for the for the year, but I think we might save that um, for either next week or the, the week after. The yeah, for the end of the year. Just I'm looking at think about time tonight and it gives us a bit more scope i think it might be in our game of the air conversation in that one so it gives us a bit more scope to go in a bit more in depth but yeah, we can squeeze in yeah it's what now or later i'm thinking later. Oh, the, yeah 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 later yeah yeah um so m- moving on um netflix are currently developing 10 games in house according to the head of gaming mike vedu is that how you spell his name pronounce his name medu vedu vedu Mike, Mike, Mike's making Mike. some games. Yeah, Mike from Netflix. What are we expecting from Netflix? Because they've had some good games recently come. Small games still. Like, I know that they're, they're starting to push and they're trying to get out more stuff. I, I've, actually, this week, the GTA trilogy definitive edition just came to Netflix for free. So if you have a Netflix subscription, you can log in. It'll reroute you to your app store and you'll basically get the game for, three, for free Sorry, via the Netflix subscription link. But again, these are games that have been on mobile for quite some time. Not the definitive editions, but GDA has been there. Uh, they also announced Sonic Mania Plus and Hades are going to be coming uh, Good early in the year as well. Which they, they are, but they're still old. Um, we know they've bought studios. They've got Oxenfree developer Night School. They've got Cozy, Cozy Grove developer, I think, Spry Fox. Um, and yeah, in an interview, he said he's got 10 games in development and has a total of 90 games across multiple deals through second party and third party. Again, Netflix seemingly going big on this, but I think with this one, just like Luna and from like previously Stadia, I think we're just I'm going to be still just apprehensive until we see the the, I, the true fruits of their labor. I think Netflix are playing a very different game to Luna and Stadia. I think yeah, they're no. They have to. I think they're not going for the big, big push to bring to be, he's the next great platform. I think they're just mm-hmm. going to slowly get transfer a lot of the Netflix subscribers over by bringing cool titles and the quality and the the renown of the games seems to be going up rather than just yeah. like tie-ins to things like Stranger Things, Nell the Drop and Grand Theft Auto and so- Sonic Mania which in Hades all which very well Grand Theft Auto trilogy the f- definitive editions are kind of not definitive <laughs> in a lot of people's yeah. minds but these are well regarded games generally speaking I think they're going to slowly up the ante and they're not they're not in rush they don't need to rush the way through it and I wouldn't be surprised if um, you know how we've had like Amazon Prime Gaming sponsor the Game Awards in the past mm-hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if 2024 Netflix is sponsoring it I mean they need to get the name out there somewhere don't they so yeah, yeah. I think again it's an interesting one to keep an eye on with Netflix games See what it evolves into, see what it looks like, see where the cloud and their downloadable mobile element plays into it. Um, they still need to get it working like on, on TV screens, like with a with a generic third party controller. Because that's another big thing. Like Netflix sits predominantly on people's living room TVs and they still don't have that as far as I'm aware, that 
transition of pick up your Xbox controller, pair it with your TV, and you're away on Netflix games. So until I think that they make that jump, they're still limiting themselves to like mobile friendly games, which is is limiting as well. Are we going to see Asgard's Wrath on Netflix anytime in the near future? Probably not. Which no. if you ain't getting that, well, I think it took Meta Quest three attempts, three iterations. I think the tar- I don't think they care about the home console market though. I think they care about the mobile market because that is the biggest mm. market share in gaming. Well, look, that's why Xbox. And they're already on right? your phone. They're already on your phone. If they can get kids who've got Netflix accounts playing games, they're bringing more games with more renown that will work on the phone. Mm-hmm. I think there's there's a clever strategy in there. It's a slow burn strategy, but that doesn't. If you're doing a slow burn by design, then that's absolutely fine. Mm-hmm. So, Chris, uh, I think we should wrap up with this game, um, this week in video game history. Thank this game in video good. game history, whatever. This you want. game in days history. This game in days history, yeah. So we're talking for December the fifteenth. Is any mm-hmm. standout titles for that for you there? Apart from Asgard's Wrath. <laughs> yeah, no, the only real one. It's a, it's been an average day, but Super Mario Run. Talking about mobile games. Ooh, Remember yeah, when Nintendo yeah. wanted to pivot Super Mario Run, first Mario game, not on a, a, a Nintendo console, seven years ago. That does not feel like I was playing that seven years ago. Yeah. 2016 on iOS, Super Mario Run launched. And I remember I played the first few levels, and then it asked me to pay money to unlock another world. And I went, fuck you, Mario. No, thank you. And I never touched it again. I I think I played the first level and went, this is boring. Swipe up to jump, swipe down to duck, right? And then it's it's a constant runner. I'd rather yeah, play like, a jungle run. I think that I do. I still stand by. I think in the mo- Nintendo could do some really awesome stuff in the mobile game space. That mm-hmm. wasn't it. That was, it was just a cheap copy of well, not a cheap copy. It was just a copy of any kind of auto runner game that exists with a Mario skin on it. It's like you could. Re- it's a weird moment where I don't think Nintendo actually treated their IP with the respect it deserves. I think they did a bit more. If I remember as well, I actually downloaded Mario Kart Tour, which is their other attempt at it, but I felt like I really struggled with the controls. Like, they just weren't as Yeah, I think Mario Kart Tour did better. They but they're both shown as 100 million downloads right now on the Android store. Yeah, most of them um, probably in the first week. So. Mario Run has got 3.8 star reviews after 1 million, and Mario Kart's got 4.2 after 2 million views, so double the reviews and a better score. So yeah. Mario Kart 2F, you're looking for some Nintendo action um, over on the Android or iOS store. But yeah, not 15th of uh, December, not a, ba- a great day for video games day, yeah. throughout history. Although, again, this, I guess as we get close at the back end of the year, it's very rare you get good re- like titles to release. Like It's all before Black Friday, right? You yeah. want to get them in for the Christmas rush, not desperately try and promote your game at the end of the year. And again, we're not looking at the whole week here. We're just looking whatever random day we happen to be recording the podcast on. And that is true. There's two games I want to bring out that actually came out today because of just the ridiculousness of it. Hentai Golf for the Nintendo Switch and Peeping See. Dom Manager. Both That's out today. Dear. So if you're into Hentai Golf or Peeping Dom Manager, well, it's out. Have fun if you like some sexual content in your games. Peeping Dom Manager is a strategy game developed by Horny Doge and published by Mango Party. Whatever that means, that's as far into it as I'm going to look for you guys out there listening. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting a mature content warning on Steam. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at some of the images and saying, I'm not going to put them up in the edit. So, look yourself. Yeah. yeah. It's a porn game. It's a straight up porn Fun- game. Funnily enough, 34 years ago in Japan, 1989, Bonk's Adventure. And I think anyone who's a horny dog out there needs a good bonking yeah. before he goes off on an adventure. So, yeah. yeah. Have a good bonking while you play some peeping doll manager. <laughs> because that's all we have time for this week. <laughs> if you've liked the video, the episode, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell so you're kept in the loop with us and all of our great content here over at Game Guild TV. We have a Discord server, you can find that below. We can talk about some awesome stuff and maybe people don't, don't manage don't, it. Don't, no. don't, don't, don't. I'm not going to create a separate channel for that. Please don't talk about that. Um, 
we have other content on the channel, such as tonight, well, at the time of recording, tonight's um, live stream, which wasn't Minecraft Lego, it was Fortnite Lego, got it right there this time. Chris's um, first look at Mori, I'm blanking on the full name. Uh, Lord of the Rings Return to Mori. Lord of the Rings Return to Mori, so if you want to see Chris in a mine, you can. Other than that, my name's been Richie. I've been Chris. Goodbye, everyone.